So let's now move on to the third component of our model of simple choice, namely uh, the claim that choices are made by comparing decision values using the drift diffusion model. To uh, sort of give you an overview of where the drift diffusion model comes from and that it's biologically plausible, I'd like to make a brief excursion into perceptual neuroscience and talk about the neural system that's involved in simple perceptual choice. And the way that perceptual choice is commonly studied is via the random dot motion task, which is illustrated here on this slide. Um, and what we have here are different conditions in which dots that are moving on the screen uh, correlate in terms of the movement directions that they have together. So we have a no correlation condition that basically looks like a TV that doesn't have any input, so very noisy. But then we can correlate a number of these dots, such as 50% of them, and make them move in the same direction. And this is something that we can easily detect. But we can vary the correlation amounts between 0 and, let's say, 50 or 100% even. Uh, any kind of, of um, reduction from 50% makes the task rather difficult. So 10 12%, 15%. It's rather difficult to detect the average motion direction of these dots. And this is the task that the monkey then performs. So there are two targets on the screen, uh, and the monkey can then indicate the direction of motion by looking at one of these targets. So for instance, in this case, most of the dots are moving to the right, so the monkey will eventually uh, move his eyes to the right, and that is an indication, so the eye, scanner, uh, the eye tracker records this, and uh, then registers this as a correct trial for which the monkey receives some kind of juice reward or a food reward, for instance. Now, the wonderful thing about this task is that there is a system that underlies this uh, performance in this task that we know pretty well about. On the one hand, the lateral intraparietal areas involved in this, particularly in um, planning uh, and, and initiating movements in the, in, the, um, uh, in the eyes, so saccades. And on the other hand, we have the middle temporal area that's involved in detecting the direction of motion. So this is a part of the, the visual system that is specialized for detecting motion. And it's organized in these neuronal columns, um, which is, well, obviously, um, th these are interesting and important for understanding the direction of motion um, and the speed of motion. Um, so research has shown that this area V5, which is another name for it, is actually organized via these directional columns um, that preferentially tune to a specific direction. So neurons in this region uh, tune to a direction or a movement direction in this, in this um, direction. Uh, whereas other neurons in this column, let's say, tune for movements almost to the right, right? And so we have these columns that contain neurons that have a sp specific uh, specialization in terms of what motion direction they detect. Uh, so basically, these are the kinds of neurons that become active in this kind of task here. And this is heavily connected with the lateral interparietal area, uh, which also contains visual and motor neurons. So the LIP belongs to the final pathway for saccadic eye movement um, and also includes the frontal eye field and the superior colliculus, which is here. Uh, but we're focusing on LIP neurons here because they're connected to area MT, which is about here. Um, and we've, we're looking at visual motor neurons, so neurons that uh, compute visual information and then make a decision about which direction uh, the eye movement should be in. So when monkeys perform this task, what we see is in these neurons in LIP, but also in other experiments in the middle temporal area, we see that there is this, this sort of rise to, to threshold uh, response. So this accumulation of evidence in one direction, namely the direction that is the um, representative of the receptive field of the neuron. So if the target is moving into the receptive field of the neuron, then we see this upward ramping of neurons that code for this spe specific direction. So when we talk about receptive field, what we mean is this specialized uh, encoding of direction for a particular column of neurons here. So in this case, the receptive field of the neurons is the one that, that uh, codes for rightward movement. And what we get then is 
then uh, depending on the correlation strength between these dots, uh, we see that the rise to threshold uh, occurs faster um, than when the correlation strength is decreased. And in the 0% direction, uh, we can see an upward motion, but obviously then the um, decision would be wrong. And when it's exactly in the opposite direction, so outside of the receptive field, we see that there's a decrease in firing rates. Um, so what this means is that there's this sort of evidence accumulation that happens both in Area MT and LIP that seems to be related to the difficulty of the task or, if you will, the strength of the evidence supporting uh, what these neurons encode, namely direction of motion into the receptive field of the neuron. Um, and this is similar to what we'll see in a second when we talk about uh, evidence accumulation for or against one versus the other option in the context of the drift diffusion model. So this knowledge now brings us to modeling simple choice and the drift diffusion model uh, that is used to do so. Uh, it was basically developed to explain accuracy and response times in binary perceptual choice. And the original developer is Radcliffe and it was done in 1978. For these types of simple tasks that I just showed you, which are one of two uh, visual stimuli moves left or right. So these binary choice type uh, experiments, but it's been shown to apply to a wider range of choices, uh, even tertiary, cho tertiary choices, so multiple alternatives uh, works just fine. Um, so the idea behind this drift diffusion model is that there's a response time that underlies uh, decisions. Sometimes decisions take longer, sometimes uh, they're a bit shorter. Uh, so there must be something uh, about about this um, that, that can be identified and that is meaningful. Um, for instance, the difficulty of the task might influence decision times, right? Also, what's important is there's some stochasticity involved in these decisions that we make when it comes to evidence accumula accumulation or binary choice, for instance. Uh, sometimes we can make the wrong decision, although, um, and obviously this occurs more often, in the case of uh, more difficult decisions. So this kind of stochastic element is commonly not modeled in standard economic models, but in uh, the co uh, context of the drift diffusion model, this can be modeled, in fact. Um, and we can extend the model from these binary visual choices to the domain of uh, economics, and we can look at comparisons of decision values. So let's let's consider the type of binary food choices that we've con considered in another video. We can apply the drift diffusion model to these types of choices, but it will require us to identify the value of these choice options before we start the binary choice experiment. And this can be done, for instance, via uh, BDM auctions or other way of, of eliciting value, like a willingness to pay um, type of experiments from participants. So you then have the values of each item and you can then look at how uh, participants um, choose over these two items and apply the drift diffusion model um, to, to even these types of economic choices. And this is what the work by Ian Kreibich and Antoni Rangel has done. But let's look at how the drift diffusion model actually looks like and uh, how it computes decision values. So the important variable is this relative decision value here. It's an iterative process that's applied to one decision, so one trial. Um, and it measures the value difference between two choice options, namely option X. So we have the value of X, which we know from sort of the pre-experiment that was applied, and we have the value of option Y. Then there's some Gaussian uh, noise that's applied to this. But the important thing is that the value on the current time step, uh, and again, this is this is an iterative process in, in the in the uh, time range of about three five seconds, or for however long the choice takes, um, and it's this it's trying to model this evidence accumulation process that we've seen that neurons do uh, just a couple of minutes ago uh, in in the area LIP and area MT. So it's the value of the previous, uh, so the, this relative decision value of the previous time step plus 
this drift rate, which is uh, usually in the order of 0 0.1 to 0 0.9, so value between 0 and 1, which gives an updating weight, basically. Uh, and this difference term here, which is the difference between one choice options value and the other choice options value plus some noise. And using this relative decision value, we can then sort of rise to the threshold of one option versus another option. I'll show you this in a figure in a second. This process then continues until a pre-specified barrier is crossed. And by pre-specified barrier, uh, we mean a boundary that when it's crossed, for instance, the option X boundary, then this item is chosen versus the other item. But when the option Y boundary is crossed, then the other item is chosen. Let's say this is, this is a Twix bar and this is a bag of chips. And then we're accumulating evidence while we're making the decision. So this is on the scale of just a couple of seconds for or against one of these two options that we obviously saw. Um, and then we rise to one of these thresholds uh, in this sort of, uh, while, while our neurons are considering these two options and the relative value, the relative decision value of these options, at which then eventually reaches here, in this case, boundary Y. And um, the model would then predict that the uh, option Y is chosen. Now this has this model has some interesting features, and it, it can explain uh, quite flexibly a number of of items that we observe. So one of the things that we do observe is um, that when the difference is large, so when I value a chips bag much higher than I do Twix because I prefer salty foods on, on average, then this rise to threshold value is much faster. However, when it's small then this rise to threshold um, slope here uh, takes much longer, uh, much longer. So we have sl slower choices. The, the, the slope is much flatter relative to this. So this is something that this model can, can model quite well because it takes into account reaction times. Reaction times can, can predict the slope of, of, uh, of our decision of our evidence accumulation process, if you will. And remember also that this looks very much like what these neurons in LIP do uh, when they are voting for a certain direction, which then obviously also leads to a reward. So it's reward-based. Another thing that this model uh, quite flexibly takes into account are speed accuracy trade-offs. So we can adjust the boundaries here and how much evidence we require to make a decision. So if we have less time, we can say that, well, let's not accumulate so much evidence, but let's make a decision already when a lower boundary is crossed, right? So if we, let's say as experimenters, limit the amount of time that participants have to make a decision. Um, and this is something that the DDM can also deal with time pressure and these types of speed accuracy trade-offs, which are very commonly observed in cognitive sciences. So let's look at the features of the drift diffusion model. It has some uh, advantages, obviously. Uh, one of the things is that it allows for noisy choice, um, which is actually biologically plausible because we have neurostochasticity. It is actually a logistic function uh, of the value difference between the choice option A and choice option B, which is depicted here. So we can uh, look at this as the probability of choosing one or the other option. In this case, it's choosing the left option. And as a function of the value of the left versus the right option rating, which is, again, this, this item um, that we record at the beginning of the experiments where we have, a, let's say, a willingness to pay or a relative uh, a preference voiced for one or the other option. So when the difference is negative, obviously the, the uh, likelihood of choosing the left option is low. When it's a positive, then it's high. And this is again what allows for this stochasticity, right? When we're here in the middle at the indifference point, then obviously the probability is 50-50. Uh, so there's a positive probability of making mistakes because it's modeled as a logistic function. And this is related to this difference between VA and VB, so the two values that we have here. Um, then it takes into account reaction times, which are modeled here in the gray, 
and on the other y-axis we have reaction times and again when we reach this indifference point between two choice options uh, we at the indif we we have uh, this logistic voice choice function here but we also see that the reaction times are longest at the indifference point and this is actually something uh, that shouldn't be the case because here we really don't care if we choose one or the other options but we take longest to to make this decision and this has been successfully tested with both neural and behavioral uh, uh, choices or data if you will so let's consider a study that actually looked at this and uh, identified brain areas that are involved in in this process um, namely regions that correlate with predictions of the fitted model uh, regions that incorporate activity from the VMPFC, which is involved in computing values, and regions that modulate activity in motor cortex. Um, and there's a, there's a wonderful paper uh, by Boston et al., published in PNS in 2010, that looked at exactly this type of accumulation process. The uh, task, in principle, is sort of a mixed gamble task, where we have gains and losses, and the gains and losses could be either small or large, so here we have large gain, large, large, small loss, large loss, small gain, large gain, and that's then indicated by these, by these squares. So participants are making a decision in the scanner about um, whether they should take a gamble like this or not. So here's the, the question, take the gamble, and then we have the color that indicates uh, the magnitude of the gain and the shape that indicates the magnitude of the loss, right? So we have yellow for small gain, green for large gain, uh, square for small loss, and green for a uh, uh, circle for large loss. So we want a uh, large gain, so we want a green square, which is sort of the ideal outcome here, uh, or the ide ideal gamble that we would accept. So then what they're finding is that the uh, reward magnitude is encoded in the nucleus accumbens while participants are considering these gambles, whereas the loss magnitude is um, computed in the amygdala, right? This kind of makes sense. We have these two regions that we know are involved in, in sort of rewards and, and uh, in a sense, punishments, if you will, or negative affect. Then a comparison of the reward loss difference is computed in this network, which includes the VMPFC as well, right? This is the the region that integrates the reward and the loss value in this experiment. And finally, uh, we have to form a decision uh, in regions that are involved in both attention but also computations of the motor output here in intraparietal sulcus. And what we see here is a correlation actually between the uh, decision time that the model predicts. So. The IPS then correlates with how long people take to make the, uh, the decision. And this gives you sort of a, a cascade of events that occur at the level of the brain um, from identifying the value of the lotteries to integrating these different values. Again, we have benefits, we have costs that are integrated in VMPFC, and then to forming a decision based on accumulating the evidence because the evidence is not clear it requires um, some some recall from memory what color means uh, what shape means and then integrating this um, so this is sort of a neural correlate of the types of processes at least in this specific instantiation uh, that need to take uh, that the brain needs to take into account to form a decision and it is uh, consistent with what the uh, drift diffusion model would predict.